uh, session. We'll formally start the session in two minutes. Please bear with us. Thank you. So good day, everyone, and welcome to the fourth webinar of International Ideas Democratic Development in Melanesia. So today's webinar, uh, we'll have us thinking, what is happening to democracy in Melanesia? So in the next hour and a half, we will be discussing the state of democracy in this region, particularly the countries of Fiji, Papua New Guinea, and Solomon Islands based on the IDEA's Global State of Democracy Indices. So my name is Naila Prieta. I am a program officer with the Asia and the Pacific Program of International IDEA, and I will be your host and moderator for this session. Before we uh, start, I would just like to ask everyone to please be mindful of some house rules. So during the session, please keep your microphone on mute and your video turned off. If you have any questions for our speakers, please use the chat box that you see on your screen. There will be opportunities to uh, provide comments, uh, share your ideas and ask questions uh, later in the program. This webinar is also live streamed on IDEA's Facebook page and links to the resources that will be shared here will be shared after this session. So and on this webinar, uh, an overview of the state of democracy of the three Melanesian countries from the Global State of Democracy Indices or GSOD will be presented, after which our guest experts from Fiji, Papua New Guinea and Solomon Islands will each provide a commentary. Their thoughts on do this data provides a picture of the current challenges and opportunities for democracy in these countries. And given the challenges, what reforms should be considered? After the commentary, we will have an open discussion. So we encourage our viewers and listeners to stand by and join the open forum later. I believe you can also provide your questions and comments on our Facebook page. To start off the webinar is a presentation of the Global State of Democracy Indices and overview of the respective GSOD profiles of the three Melanesian countries. I am pleased to introduce Ms. Lina Rikila Tamang, our Regional Director for Asia and the Pacific of International IDEA. In this capacity, Lena oversees the regional programming and country programs in Myanmar, Nepal, Fiji, Bhutan, and the Philippines. Prior to this, Lena served as country manager of our program in Nepal, creating and supporting constitution building initiatives in the country. Without much further ado, I hand the floor over to you, Lena. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Naila, and uh, also my thanks to everyone attending to and to our three speakers who have agreed to comment on the state of democracy in uh, Melanesia. So my task today is to present to you with the um, International Ideas Global State of Democracy Indices, the database, so that ideally after my presentation you would have a good sense of uh, what is it where you can find it from and what you can do with it. Uh, whether you are a researcher, policymaker, uh, media or civil society representative, political leader, or simply someone willing to keen to understand uh, about this data. 
I hope you can uh, see my uh, screen. Is it moving? Yes. Uh, I'm not see now that um, whether it's uh, moving forward. Oh yeah. So we have four different products under under the uh, umbrella of Global State of Democracy project. One is the uh, biannual report, Global State of Democracy report. Our flagship report, which will be launched next in, in the coming November 2021. And the GSOD indices is the, the statistical data uh, that provides the basis for the report. And in, in addition, we have global uh, COVID-19 monitoring tool, as the name indicates, tracks the impact of the pandemic on democracy and human rights worldwide. And lastly, we also produce these Global State of Democracy in Focus uh, publications, which are short, thematic or regional analysis on uh, state of democracy. And all these, all these products can be found from International Ideas uh, website. So let us dive into it. Um, how do we measure democracy um, through, and, and, one, and what do we measure? when we say that we do measure democracy. And here we have our global state of democracy uh, framework. I think it's important to start with our definition of uh, democracy, which is very simple. Popular control of decision makers and equality of citizens in exercising that right. So this definition has implications on how we categorize democracies. Uh, hybrid and authoritarian regimes, and I will come to this point uh, after after a few minutes. We have the five main attributes that we consider as the building blocks of democracy: uh, representative government, fundamental rights, checks on government, impartial administration, and participatory uh, engagement. And these are further divided into 16 uh, sub-attributes and 116 indicators that form the basis of the data. So for example, here, fundamental rights is divided into access, of, access to justice, civil liberties and social rights and equality. And social rights and equality, for example, is further divided to, to uh, measure social group equality, gender equality, and uh, basic uh, welfare. So our overall aim is to provide a nuanced picture of state of democracy in any given country, uh, recognizing that the country may well do, uh, may do well in some aspects or, and uh, less well in, in some other. And it's important to make all these different aspects visible and it's not very productive to reduce any country's state of democracy, let's say to, to one, one simple score. The indices cover a period of 45 years from 1975 to 2020. The latest data is now uploaded since June uh, covering 2020. Uh, so last 45 years. And we consider it important to provide this sort of a historical uh, perspective. Um, I think it's true that we can say that yesterday was not better in, in on what it comes to many of the attributes uh, worldwide, um, even when the last five to seven years have uh, no doubt seen declines, erosion, and even backsliding of democracy in many parts of the world, also in Asia and the Pacific uh, region. It, indices include 165 countries. And since 2020, data also includes the Solomon Islands and Fiji for the first uh, 
time. And you may ask uh, why only now uh, from 2020? Um, answer is that when the indices were founded, we included countries, only those countries that had more than 1 million uh, people. Uh, another criteria was availability and accuracy of, of the data that we needed. But uh, after much lobbying of our HQ from, from this part of the world, we, and also after checking that the data that we needed would be available, uh, even if there are some weaknesses uh, of, on, that, uh, on that front, these two countries were added and hopefully soon uh, in, we can add some, some more islands into our databases. So how do we measure? Uh, what is so the uh, indices can be, it's an index of indices. Uh, its underlying data is drawn from 12 high quality data sets including the variety of, of democracy, we them, which uh, constitutes majority of the data that we draw from, but then also all these other, other data sets and databases that uh, are there. And um, the, all, these, all the uh, code books and anyone really into, uh, into the data and aggregating and indices you can find, our global state of democracy code book from the from the website and where it's where it's explained in in detail. So the types of uh, political regimes uh, uh, in our indices we uh, divide in simply democracies, hybrid regimes, and authoritarian uh, regimes. And as was indicated or alluded by our definition of democracy, our, we consider the representative government is the, is the main uh, attribute when we, we look at when we do this uh, categorization of the political regimes and the requirement of minimally competitive multi-party elections to qualify as, uh, as democracy. And then further on of the democracies, we do categorize the democracies as per the performance levels to high performing democracies, mid range performing democracies and low or weak uh, performing uh, democracies according to, according to their different uh, the values. So how we can also, I wanted to give you a glimpse of what can you do with the database and how you can use it yourself. Here is a, a, a world map of the, of the databases where you can hover around the map and you can see Russia hybrid regimes, Iceland as a high performance and China authoritarian uh, regime. You can look at the representative democracy, how the world looks like uh, as color coded and then go to clean elections. And their example is Mongolia as, uh, as high performing on what it comes to clean uh, elections. And when you hover around the map and you come to uh, say Russia, you click, and then you, you get to, uh, to the page where all the, all the data can be uh, found. Another way uh, presenting is to compare uh, with, the, with the countries. Uh, sorry, this was the, already the... I need it to go to the next one. So here, if you select Africa, it will and representative government. It will show you the historical development since 1975 up to 2019. This one, you can add the sub attributes: clean elections, inclusive suffrage, free political parties, elected government, and see the see the trends. And then you can also compare uh, with the uh, other regions. So. 
uh, subregions in Africa, say, how about West Africa? How does it uh, compare with the data from uh, North Africa, for example? I'm to move forward with my slides. There, uh, so this is, these are the country profiles. Uh, this is how a country profile looks like if you download it from the, from the website. Um, and you can there look at also each of these attributes uh, separately and over time. And there on the page, you can also find a narrative detailing the most recent democratic developments in the context of COVID-19 uh, pandemic. As you can see, Fiji is considered a weak or low performing democracy as per our indices. Many of the attributes are under the yellow, which is a medium, uh, medium performing, uh, except social rights and equality, which is uh, very weak, low performing, and the participatory engagement, uh, which is overall uh, red or low performing, and the sort of high performing score is on the inclusive uh, suffrage. Same, uh, same download country profile, Papua New Guinea, also weak uh, performing uh, democracy, um, where also the low. Um, low performing also on social rights and equality, but then also on impartial administration and in particular when it comes to absence of corruption. But then on the other hand, uh, high performing on what it comes to not only to inclusive suffrage, but also on elected government and uh, civil liberties as per, as, per the, as per the data that we have received. And Solomon Islands, um, again, weak or low performing uh, democracy, uh, categorized as democracy, uh, where we have yet again, social rights and equality uh, uh, in the category of low, low performing um, and, and the participatory engagement, uh, again, in reference in particular to direct democracy and local democracy but also high performing on what it comes to represent representative democracy, a representative government and uh, media integrity under the, under the checks on, on government. I am simply uh, sending here the data and the picture and we have invited our, our commentators to give us the analyze, analyze this and uh, give us the sort of what might be underlying uh, here of the data and explaining some of this, this data. This is simply another way of uh, presenting the same data that you can also generate from the database this way of, uh, of looking at it. So here, for example, we could look at three political parties it's considered a medium uh, performer on political parties, Papua New Guinea. Uh, it is, as you can see, it is uh, it's ahead of the uh, Asia and the Pacific average, but behind the world's uh, average or world's uh, democracies. Sorry, where? There. Um, and of course, Asia and the Pacific uh, average obviously includes democracies and non-democracies um, uh, alike. You can also make comparisons uh, when you go to the indices database. Uh, here we are comparing representative, one of the attributes, representative government uh, from 1975 to, to 2020. Here, uh, Fiji is the red one with obviously the, uh, the periods of, of non-democratic government being uh, reflected in the data. Uh, we do have Papua New Guinea with a little bit there uh, 
and we have uh, Solomon Islands, perhaps the most consistently moving uh, upwards on what it comes to representative uh, uh, government. And you can use the data and generate similar type of charts on, on all, all the attributes as well as the sub-attributes and make the uh, comparisons to between countries or between country and the region or country and sub-region or the country and the world and uh, see how, how does the how, how your own country, for example, looks like or and compares with the others. But main importantly, you can also compare your own country on what it comes with itself in terms of the timelines. And here, I, I don't have a slide about, but you could also uh, look at the data only from the last, say, sorry, 10 years um, and, and generate the picture where you can see more in detail the development over the last uh, five years or 10 years uh, or so. So I wanted to end there. Uh, these are the, again, uh, the, the resources that are all available in our uh, website. And as mentioned, the Global State of Democracy uh, report, which is drawing on the on the indices, but also then includes more sort of a qualitative analysis of the data is to be launched in, in 2020, uh, sorry, in November 2021, looking at the data of, uh, uh, of 20 up to 2020. Thank you very much. And I hope uh, I managed to uh, explain the indices so that you would be visiting our website and try your hand and uh, look at the look at what uh, what you can do with the with the data that is available and as always we uh, welcome any feedback or observations on on the data and what you can find from the website thank you and back to you Nyla. Uh, thank you so much lena for that, that like a comprehensive uh, presentation and definitely there's so much to unpack from those uh, data. So now it will, you know, we will turn over um, uh, to our guest speakers for, for their respective reactions on, on this data. So uh, please let me introduce first our first speaker, Romulo Nayakalevu from Fiji. So Romulo is a human rights lawyer who has served the Pacific region for over 10 years. He used to be the program manager for governance and legal affairs with the Melanesian Spearhead Group Secretariat in Vanuatu, and has also served as a human rights advisor with the Secretariat for Pacific Community and the Regional Office of the Human Rights Commission. So Romulo, aside from um, this role, has also served on nonprofit boards, such as the Save the Children and Scripture Union Fiji. So Romulo, over to you. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Naila, for your uh, gracious in, uh, introduction. Uh, thank you also, Lina, for uh, introducing and explaining a little bit more about the state of governance uh, indices that we've uh, all here to learn a little bit more about, as well as to see uh, how they are applied uh, in our country context. Uh, before I start, I acknowledge also the uh, panel members, uh, the Professor Tarsis uh, from the Solomon Islands, uh, as well as uh, Ms. Serena from Papua New Guinea. Uh, I acknowledge also uh, international idea staff, uh, Adi, Alina, Naila, and um, uh, Rajen, uh, who are also uh, facilitating today's uh, conversation. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you again for your introduction and I line for the insights that uh, provide the basis for our discussions today, uh, Lina. Uh, allow me to briefly digress and congratulate, of course, the Fijian men's seventh team for their second Olympic gold medal and for winning a uh, smashing final against our Pacific one hour of New Zealand uh, in a sizzling nail biting final in Tokyo last night. Uh, following that victory, I must uh, admit that for a brief moment, I completely forgot about the COVID pandemic that grips my nation uh, as I wanted to run out and celebrate with the rest of Fiji. Uh, but then uh, my eyes fell on my computer and I 
realize the celebration will have to it. Uh, so again, congratulations, Team Fiji, and all the best to our other Olympians, including our women's sevens rugby team playing today. I uh, take the opportunity, of course, uh, to, to congratulate uh, International IDEA uh, for the launching of this updated uh, global state of democracy indices uh, at a time when it is crucial to measure state progress and to shine a light on state practices. These indicators provide a tangible framework by which we can assess a state's governance practice and provide the basis for holding governments accountable uh, within the acceptable uh, norms and standards. The indices uh, provide valuable and timely information that seeks to measure various key uh, indicators of the state of governance around the world. I recognize that we may not have sufficient time in this presentation to do an in-depth analysis of the results, uh, but the audience is also invited to have a read of the indices, uh, uh, make comparisons with other countries as uh, Lena had shown us uh, earlier uh, this afternoon, uh, all regions and seek clarification if needed uh, with the team at uh, IDEA, including the Pacific office, both in Canberra uh, and here in Suva. Uh, as a governance practitioner in the region, I find that these in indices are valuable tools to assess our progress individually as specific states and collectively as a region. Uh, it provides a benchmark on areas that needs improvement or to be strengthened to ensure greater accountability in all aspects of governance, particularly around the rule of law, open and transparent government. Um, <coughs> excuse me. open uh, and transparent government, as well as the realization of fundamental human rights, especially in this COVID period. The comparative aspect of the indices uh, uh, means that we can measure our progress to other similar states uh, in the Pacific or across the world and see how far we fare in our progress towards creating a more democratic society. Uh, moreover, these indices undoubtedly will inform the status of governance, especially in this COVID period, and hopefully guide policy and lawmakers, uh, practitioners, diplomats, academic students, political commentators, uh, civil society organizations, the donor communities, and government enthusiasts on measurable outcomes and areas that need to be improved to ensure solid governance practices within our states and region. Uh, for the purposes of our presentation, we have been provided four guiding questions, and I intend to address those four guiding questions uh, in, in my presentation on the status of governance in Fiji. Uh, the first uh, a set of uh, general information or signpost is to comment on the data that will be uh, that has been presented uh, in the context of Fiji. Uh, as uh, Lina has alluded to and as shown by the data, Fiji is considered a weak, low democracy country on international ideas uh, map of global indices. Fiji's governance trend as captured in this data is an interesting one uh, from 1975 to the year 2000. What the data shows is that from the period up to the 1987 coup, uh, Fiji's governance uh, indicators demonstrate a steady growth trend of about 0.5 on the upper scale, uh, whereas uh, since 1987, which can be attributed to the coup and related incidents, the government governance trend on average demonstrated low performance to lower mid-term performance. This trend picked up again from the period of 1992 and declined again in 2000, picked up again from 2002 and then declined again in 2006. These periods commensurate with the period of political upheaval and political transition in Fiji. So at the onset, we can see the link between political instability, volatility, uncertainty, and of course, weak governance. The focus of today's discussion, the focus of today's discussion is on the 2020 uh, global state of democracy data, uh, which is influenced by the government's response to the COVID uh, pandemic. So that then leads me to the next signpost, which is what are the challenges and opportunity for democracy in your country? Uh, the greatest challenge for most of our democracy, democracies, including Fiji, is both our adherence to the rule of law, the ability of state institutions to fulfill their statutory functions and roles, and the broader respect for fundamental rights and freedom by the state. 
In other words, it comes down for me to leadership and how those that exercise power are able to exercise it within the confinements of the rules that are in place. Fiji continues to confront and navigate challenging times brought about by an evolving legal order and now exacerbated by the forces of a raging pandemic that continues to pose as an existential threat. As history shows us that in trying or perilous times, national decisions are made, often made in the name of human security, but at the cost of basic rights and freedoms. While constitutional safeguards are in place in Fiji and state institutions that oversee the protection and promotion of human rights are functional, there remains many challenges associated with the realization of basic rights and freedom. Fiji's constitution protects economic, social, and cultural rights, as well as civil and political rights. The caveat, though, is the limitations around both the economic, social, and cultural rights and civil and political rights. Moreover, Fiji, is the only Pacific country to have ratified all nine core human rights treaties, including both the covenants on civil and political rights, as well as the economic, social, and cultural rights. So Fiji's role in protecting uh, human rights is not just founded in the constitution of Fiji, but that which is also prescribed under international treaty laws. While permissible limitations of rights are recognized in international human rights law, these limitations must one, be prescribed by law, two, on grounds permitted in relation to the rights, right concerned, and three, a reasonable, necessary, and proportionate means for pursuit of a legitimate objective. So any derogation from fundamental rights must adhere to the permissible limitations provided by law. Fiji's governance indices are predominantly mid-range performances, which is indicative of the evolving state of the rule of law or by law, the strength of state institutions, and the protection and promotion of basic and fundamental rights. Interestingly, what the indices also show is that except for one, which is inclusive suffrage, uh, Fiji ranks below the global average on each of the measurable indicators. And particularly a lowest indices is from attribute five, which is participatory engagement. The indices are informed by publicly available information. And as Alina had also alluded to, the other sources that informs the data for the, uh, to, to drop the indices uh, that speak to the governance indicators that uh, is being mentioned. Fiji's rankings as follows, uh, and, and interestingly, you will also find if you click onto the Fiji um, link, uh, in terms of high performance, we have only one indices on high performance, as I alluded to, which is inclusive suffrage or the right to vote uh, regardless of circumstances, gender, race, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, most of our performances are mid-range performance, and I will look at that very briefly, uh, mindful, of course, that I don't have uh, a lot of time to be able to do a deeper analysis of that. But attribute one, which looks at representative governments and its sub-attributes, which includes clean elections, free political parties, and elected government, Public information which informs this attribute shows various actions against political parties or political party representatives that may affect the work of political parties, party officials and politicians from these political parties. In terms of attribute two, looking at fundamental rights and its sub attributes, which includes access to justice, civil liberties, um, uh, but on the third uh, sub attributes, uh, Fiji records a low performance, which is on social rights and equality. Uh, and it draws from the data with references to the court cases before the courts uh, and the rulings made by the magistrates and the high court respectively on the legality or otherwise of the legal powers exercised by senior officials, including the prime minister to restrict freedoms and rights among others in the early days of the second wave of the pandemic. Uh, the restrictions on civil liberties include arrests for curfew breaches and related breaches of the Public Order Act, which also uh, looks at um, how uh, certain segments of the community uh, have been investigated uh, and charged uh, for, for breaches of the Public Act, include, uh, include social uh, or online postings. Uh, attribute three checks on governance and its sub-attributes, which includes media integrity, judicial independence, and an effective parliament. Uh, 
Uh, and it shows that uh, there's a continued functioning of all these key institutions in Fiji despite the pandemic. It is important that in any society built on democratic values and ideals that we both have strong and functioning parliament and judiciary as two arms of government that provides the checks and balances on each other. A functioning and an independent judiciary is often the final bastion of rights of people. The courts must remedy, readily be accessible for people to seek legal relief and remedies on decisions that may be unjust and imposed without proper consultations. Parliament's role in legislative oversight must be strengthened and parliamentary process must enhance, not diminish democracy. The role of the media dubbed the fourth estate is equally important, especially in our current pandemic, in highlighting crucial information and important news to the community. Attribute four, which looks at impartial administration and its sub attributes, uh, which includes predictable enforcement and absence of corruption. These measures how state agencies have acted to enforce the rule of law and prosecute corrupt practices and behaviors. To avoid corrupt behaviors, it is essential that there is greater accountability and transparent decision-making process that encourages public participation and scrutiny. And of course, uh, mindful, uh, as I alluded to, Fiji is performing within the mid-range uh, performance. And the final attribute, which is participatory engagement and its sub-attributes, which include civil society participation and electoral participation. Uh, Fiji, of course, is low uh, on direct democracy and local democracy, uh, as, as alluded to by the data. Uh, Fiji's governance trends indicates that the, the need for both government and citizens to keep working to strengthen the state of governance by which citizens are able to hold government accountable within the framework of rule and of law and good governance. While the state ensures open and transparent governance with citizenry participation in the affairs of the state. Fiji has the opportunity based on this synthesis to work towards involving, improving each of the five attributes measured herein. While the results of each attribute may also change depending on the available information, what is obvious based on the current state of governance is to keep improving in all the crucial areas highlighted in the indices. Uh, second, uh, the third uh, signpost is what reforms do you think is needed to improve the country rating? Uh, to improve the country rating on any of the governance indicators, it is important for decision makers and the citizenry to see how they can actively and openly engage each other on all matters that affect both the governed and the governed, uh, the governors and the governed, uh, or the duty bearers and the rights holders. The state as a duty bearer has the responsibility to protect and promote human rights and citizens as rights holders must be able to claim these rights within the existing legal framework. As alluded to earlier, citizenry engagement with the government, including through the media must also be safeguarded and protected. Any free society must be able to have a free press and free thinking individuals who can dissent lawfully on aspects of governance without fear and rancor and participate in decisions that impact on their basic rights and freedoms. At a time when information is crucial on COVID-19, on medications and treatment, health restrictions and protocols, etc., accessing this needed information from government or relevant sources is equally important and needs to be readily available where possible and safeguarded by the state. Uh, freedom uh, of expression, the right to information are crucial and needs to be protected and realized, uh, especially in this time. People must not be persecuted or intimidated simply for holding an opinion or expressing themselves in a manner that may be contrary to the majority views. Dissent must be encouraged and safeguarded in a democracy. State institutions must be able to exercise restraint as well as perform their duties without fear or favor. There must be a strong emphasis on the rule of law and not rule by law. The law must not be used as a tool for oppression to silence dissidents, to intimidate opposition or to consolidate power. The principles of good governance predicated on open, fair, accountable, and transparent decision must be on the basis, must be the basis for any just, equitable, and fair society. Moreover, the role of civil society and faith-based communities are as important partners to government and of government, especially at a time when more hands than one is needed to provide social welfare, counseling, or comfort for those in need in our communities. Pandemic and natural disasters, among others, often show the heart of communities and the role of the CSOs and FBOs 
ought to be encouraged and supported within acceptable health protocols in place. Given the prolonged closures and related health protocols in place, mental and psychological impacts can weigh on sectors of the population. Therefore, necessary support systems must be in place to counter the psychological and mental cost of a prolonged lockdown and other restrictive measures. Intimidation and violence against CSO. Sorry, Romulo, I hope you can wrap up soon, if that's okay. We have more time later for yeah, a discussion. Thanks. Thank you. I will wrap up. Uh, I'm, I'm coming to the end of it now. Okay. So uh, while I note the data to inform the Global Society of Governance indicators for Fiji's up to the first quarter of 2021, the trend may indicate a decline or democratic backsliding should the COVID response remain in a state of flux. Given Fiji's weak democratic indices, it is important that this situation is arrested to prevent further decline and to do uh, and to do, there is a need for stronger collective citizenry participation, whether it is by, by online platforms, the media, or talkback shows and programs, and government-supported platforms for dialogue and reciprocal engagement. The opportunity exists to build better governance architectures and structures that can weather the COVID crisis. Uh, various civil, civil liberties have been limited owing to the existence of the current pandemic, which includes freedom of movement, freedom of assembly, freedom of religion, and freedom of expression. Heavy-handed tactics must give way to dialogue and mutual respect for rights, freedoms, and the rule of law. At a time when the freedoms and rights can be easily sacrificed on the altars of convenience and security, there must be stronger oversight into the roles of the state and its agencies, while independent institutions tasked with human rights oversight must be diligent in holding the states accountable for its human rights practices. Uh, as, as I uh, also as I wrap up, as part uh, as parting though for international idea, it is important to recognize that as long as the pandemic persists, that more efforts must be made to monitor and track the state of governance across the world. And, all, and for all of us, especially our governments, is that uh, how we all come out of this pandemic will depend on how we manage our state of governance in the pandemic itself. As our Fijian rugby team reminds us at the end of every game of victory with the song, we have overcome. We can overcome if we consider our humanity, strengthen our governance process and remind ourselves that we are, in, we are all in this together, both the governed, a government and the governed. And I thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you so much, Romulo. So it's my pleasure to introduce our next speaker to uh, give her views on the data presented on Papua New Guinea. It's nice to see you again, Serena. Always good to see you, Nilo. Yeah. So Serena Sasengian is a member of the Board of Advisors of International IDEA. Uh, Serena is also currently the CEO of the Digital Foundation, and she co-founded uh, the, the Voice Inc., a living youth development organization, which she co-founded while attending the University of Papua New Guinea. Um, Serena is also very quite active in the nonprofit sector, where she sits on the board of several organizations, including, of course, The Voice, Family PNG, and Lowy Institute's PNG Australian Network. So Serena, over to you. Excellent, thank you so much. Um, so thank you IDEA for the opportunity to be able to comment on the 2020 GSOD um, index and findings for Papua New Guinea. Um, I will be, uh, basically what I will be saying are comments that are my own and do not represent any of the organizations that I am a part of. Um, I've divided my comments into three key areas um, that we were asked to do around commenting on the data set that was presented, um, thoughts on challenges and opportunities, and um, areas that I think needs to be focused on to improve, improve our quality of democracy. So I'll, I'll speak to that and I'll try to um, talk within the time frame that was given. Um, so firstly, I just want to say um, where PNG is ranked, it's currently at the same, um, similar to PG, mid-range performance uh, as of the GSOD 2020 index. We have maintained an unbroken record of democratic governance since our independence in 1975. Um, national elections are, are held regularly. The judiciary has uh, um, significant independence and the media and citizens are also free to criticize the government. Um, the area that we are performing very low in, as um, 
uh, Lena had pointed out is in, in impartial administration. And this isn't surprising because um, it's quite well known that PNG has and struggles with very high levels of uh, corruption that we have in the country. When I think about the process of, um, of democratization across states like ours, um, I think it's always really important to just point out at the beginning, um, across the world, all nations started off with tribes. Papua New Guinea, exactly the same, actually probably one of the most tribally diverse nations on earth. Um, from tribes, uh, we evolved into having kingdoms, what the rest of the world did. Uh, and then we had governments as a result to very corrupt kingdoms. Um, for Papua New Guinea, we've literally just gone from a tribal nation straight into government, um, where we never really had centralized authority. So I think the state here continues to struggle with, uh, one, exerting its authority, um, number two, building its capability, and in doing so, building more legitimacy across the, the board. So um, as uh, someone that has lived through very, um, well, I say, transformative periods uh, in Papua New Guinea, I've literally... Um, been able to experience, and I think a lot of my peers um, that are also joining online as well will be able to say, we're, we're literally experiencing and living in this transition of the democracy. Um, so I think that the results that have been pointed um, or have been published uh, in the 2020 findings are very specific because it's, it's meant to be quantifiable um, and it's, help, it's meant to help us actually see the trends um, that we can look to to see um, is, is, you know, democracy, are we seeing backsliding or are we seeing progress? And since 1975, if you actually do um, the, the trends over time, you'll see PNG, it has dropped, but not significantly, not to levels so where we can say we are fully experiencing democratic backsliding. So I'm just gonna speak quite briefly to just the, the trends um, for the five attributes um, from the GSOD report. Firstly, in terms of representative um, government, PNG has scored uh, 0.49. And inside representative government, we have things like measures of clean elections, um, inclusive suffrage, free political parties, and elected government. Um, I, I think that the, the, the um, ranking that has been given, the, the score that has been given is quite accurate. Um, in terms of um, clean elections, it, it just continues to be an area that we will um, faces a major challenge, and I'll speak to that a bit later inside my presentation. But in 2020, um, the autonomous region of Bougainville had its first general elections, and it um, had elected Ishmael Torama as the president. So we're seeing there that there is definitely this culture of ensuring that elections are held, um, that people do participate. Um, we continue to struggle, obviously, with building stronger political parties. But again, that is the process of people participating in democracy. And that's kind of reflected a bit further down. And, and I'll speak to that. But otherwise, um, I think that that's quite a, um, an accurate um, score that has been given. Uh, in terms of fundamental rights, we scored uh, 0.55. And this is an area I think that we, we do quite well on in terms of the constitution and enshrining all these fundamental rights. But we struggle very much in terms of the actual enforcement of breaches of fundamental rights. Access to justice continues to be a problem. Um, civil liberties are, are protected. Obviously, we're living in the, um, the, the through the era of the COVID-19 pandemic. And constitutions you know, would have been tested during this time across the world with emergency regulations coming into um, the fore and government trying to control and restrict the movements of people. And in Papua New Guinea in particular, where you have very low levels of literacy, um, there's a lot of misinformation that's out there. And also a lot of lack of trust as well, uh, especially when you have high rates of corruption. Um, the, the government has really struggled with um, ensuring that people were adhering to the emergency um, regulations and the control measures that were in place. We've just been quite fortunate that we haven't had um, levels of um, uh, um, cases increasing. Um, th there has been an increasing strain on the health system and the healthcare system, but we haven't seen the number of deaths that are being experienced in other countries. And I, I you know, think of Fiji at this time as well, that's dealing with the um, COVID-19 Delta variant. So, um, I think under fundamental rights, the area that we also really struggle in is around gender equality. 
Uh, and this is across the board, board in terms of um, female participation. It's what you can see uh, right now in parliament where there's zero women um, that have been elected in, um, but also the rates of violence um, that women and children continue to experience. Um, so that's just um, you know, one, one thing that we have to continue to, to work on. Um, for number four, the fourth attribute in terms of checks on government, um, we scored 61. Um, in 2020, PNG passed a law in, um, in February to provide protection for whistleblowers. Um, in November 2020, the um, parliament passed, uh, unanimously passed the bill to establish the independent commission um, against corruption, so ICAC. So there is work being done um, at a, a higher level to try and put in place um, other, institu uh, other institutions that will help with providing those checks um, and balances. Um, so uh, I think that again, it, the, the ranking is uh, um, quite reflective of where we were in 2020. Uh, in terms of impartial administration, yeah, we scored very um, low there, 0.38. Again, not surprising at all. Um, you know, Transparency International uh, Corruption Perception Index ranked PNG 142 out of 180 nations. So systemic uh, corruption continues to be a challenge. It's something we need to address so that we can improve the quality of our democracy. And um, finally, around participatory engagement, um, we, as you can see from um, the findings, um, PNG continues again to struggle in that respect. And it's, I always find the irony in this because uh, as a Melanesian country, consensus building and ensuring that people are part of decision-making is actually, has always been how we've operated. It's our ethos since time immemorial, but I think just under the structures and the systems of the state, we still are struggling. And again, I'm going back to that example that I had said earlier, where we never really had centralized governments and people have been very used to just working in more closer clusters. So I think this is the culture of democracy. And this is something that we really have to um, see improvements on, particularly in a time now where we're living in the digital age. There's more connectivity, there's more access, plus we're experiencing a youth bulge. So young people will want to um, contribute to their democracy and hopefully we're gonna see some trends, better trends in the future. So in terms of um, challenges and opportunities, um, PNG is facing a triple crisis, uh, not dissimilar from the world. COVID-19 um, is really the, the biggest uh, sort of issue that's out there. Um, and we as a country, um, you know, currently have 17,000 cases, 192 deaths. So you compare that to the rest of the world. Again, I said we've just either we're not accounting for cases, which actually we know um, is, is a challenge for us, um, or, or we've just also been quite lucky, but we'll have to just watch and see the Delta variant. And that's definitely going to have an impact in, in the way that we report for 2021, what the actions the government will take. Um, I think secondly, the, the thing that we are also, also struggling with is political instability and indecisiveness as well that we're seeing at a uh, political level. Um, Parliament was adjourned um, in April this year. Uh, it was um, you know, reported that it was due to COVID-19, but we also know that there was also a vote of no confidence that was um, uh, going to happen as well. And we're seeing now um, that we cannot bend the rules to suit our purpose, even to create more stability. So I think there's something that we're going to have to watch. Um, also, one of the biggest, I think, things that just beyond the radar in terms of a challenge is the fact that our um, PNG uh, has not conducted a census. Um, the last one that was done was more than 10 years ago. So it would be a, a big, big challenge for us in terms of the lead up to our 2022 elections. Um, and it's definitely gonna have an impact on our score. Um, and I think just the last thing I wanted to just talk about was just the contracting economy um, and how that's also impacting as well on on jobs, on people, on local agency, on business. Um, these are certain policy decisions of the government, the current government when it came to um, uh, certain, you know, like our Polgera, stalling negotiations on the special mining lease, um, you know, also on around the LNG projects. This, these are all very big challenges that will also have an impact um, on the state of affairs in the country. So just the final point around what reforms do, I think we need to do to help improve our country rating. Um, one, one, Policies are one thing we're really good at doing it. Actually, PNG has 
uh, very comprehensive laws uh, and we are signatories to um, important international conventions, we need to focus on implementation. So that's the key challenge here is implementation and funding of these important institutions, for instance, ICAC, that needs to be funded. Um, two, we need to be serious about addressing corruption. Um, and three, we need to stop politicizing institutions and let them do the work for us. It would be amiss of me if I don't uh, mention just the recent um, buzz in Australian media, recently in PNG as well, around our largest bank, uh, Bank South Pacific, that was um, embroiled in allegations of facilitating um, serious money laundering between PNG and Australia, and is now the subject of enforcement, uh, regulatory enforcement by our financial intelligence unit. But I think the bizarre twist was with the central bank um, governor coming out to disassociate um, himself from and the bank from um, the unit that was actually conducting the um, investigations. And I think that this is the test of, of a democracy when you pass important reforms like anti-money laundering laws and now they're being tested. Um, being able to see it all the way through the penalties will actually show whether we're serious about addressing corruption um, in this country. And uh, we can have a lot of potential, but if the systems aren't working, then we'll continue to fail and fall far behind. So um, those are just my, my thoughts, and I thank you for the opportunity to comment. Thank you so much, Serena. Uh, there's uh, plenty of uh, issues there to discuss, discuss further later on. Um, before we go through that, I would, of course, very pleased to introduce our last, but of not certainly the least speaker to share his thoughts on the state of democracy in Solomon Islands. Um, we have here Associate Professor Tarsitius Tara Kabutaulaka. I hope I pronounce your name quite correctly, sir, <laughs> who is also the director of the University of Hawaii Center for Pacific Island Studies. So uh, Professor Tarsitius is a political scientist who has written extensively on governance and geopolitical issues in the Pacific Islands with focus on Solomon Islands. If prior to joining the University of Hawaii, he was a fellow as the, at the East West Center for six years. And prior to that, he was also a lecturer in history and political science at the University of South Pacific in Fiji. Professor, go ahead, floor is now yours. Uh, thank you, Nyla, and thank you to IDEA for inviting me, and uh, it's great to be here to participate. I, I also want to begin by congratulating Fiji uh, on the win last night. I was watching the game, and so uh, thank you to our one talks from Fiji uh, for lifting the Pacific, uh, especially at this time. So what I'm going to do is go very quickly through the attributes that have been provided and make commentary uh, in the case of Solomon Islands. And, uh, you know, listening to Papua New Guinea and to a certain extent Fiji as well, uh, listening to the case in Papua New Guinea, in many ways Solomon Islands is like a smaller version of Papua New Guinea. A lot of the challenges that Papua New Guinea has a lot of the reforms that have happened in Papua New Guinea over the years are often uh, repeated in the Solomon Islands, but at, the, at a much smaller scale. And I think that's a reflection in part of the similarities in terms of the diversity of, of cultures and people that we have in those two countries. Papua New Guinea, of course, is really, really huge. Uh, Solomon Islands, very small, but also very diverse. We have 87 different languages. English is my fourth. Uh, and so, you know, so that's, I think, worth uh, um, uh, uh, stating. I, what I'm going to do is go through the questions that have been provided and comment on the data that's been provided. And then I'll talk very briefly while doing that some of the challenges and opportunities that Solomon Islands has. Uh, and what reforms should be made and then look at 2021 uh, and moving forward. Uh, in terms of the attributes that have been provided in the report, and thank you to IDEA for this, I find them really useful in reflecting not only on Solomon Islands, but the rest of the Pacific and the rest of the world. Uh, in terms of the uh, attributes that have been provided, 
Solomon Islands performed quite well in terms of representative government, particularly in terms of inclusive suffrage and elected government. Uh, and that's not surprising given that voter turnouts in the Solomon Islands have always been really high. Even during the period when we had conflict in the Solomon Islands between the late 1990 uh, to about 2003, uh, election turnouts have always been really, really high in the Solomons. But I want to raise a couple of things in relation to this. First is the question, what motivates people to go out and vote? Is it because they want to participate in the electoral process and therefore in government? Or is it because they think that they could benefit in a different way from participation in election? Uh, and I would like to say that in the case of Solomon Islands, I think it's a bit of both, that people go out and vote because they want to participate in the electoral process, but also because they gain on the side from candidates or the hope that they will gain when candidates do get into office. Uh, and if that is the case, then it raises the question that participation does not always mess up democracy or it's not always because of what we think it is. Uh, and so something to think about when we see uh, high election participation uh, in these places, particularly Solomon Islands. The other thing I want to bring up is that the electoral systems that we have, and I'll come back to it when I talk about, elect uh, talk about reforms. So Solomon Islands has a first past the post system. Uh, and if you look at the election results that we've had since independence, actually, a lot of the members of parliament who eventually win usually receive less than half of the votes cast. That means that they do not necessarily represent a majority of the people of Solomon Islands. Uh, and so that's something that we need to look at when we are looking at this. Uh, that many of the members of parliament, uh, and Solomon Islands has 50 members of parliament, many, and in some cases, most of them receive less than half of the votes cast during elections. Uh, and, and I think uh, we, we need to look at that. The other thing is political parties. And my understanding is that political parties are supposed to help organize ideas uh, and then persuade voters that they are the alternative government. Like the case of Papua New Guinea, uh, political parties in the Solomon Islands are pretty weak. Uh, and because of that, so there are two parts to it. One is the way in which political parties are organized. They are relatively weak. A lot of them emerge just before elections. Uh, and, and so in that, that creates a whole lot of issues about campaigning and so forth. In 2000, uh, Solomon Islands introduced something called the Political Parties Integrity Act, which is supposed to strengthen political parties and their participation in elections. It hasn't worked so far. And so the question arises, what are the weaknesses of the Political Party Integrity Act? And whether or not it has facilitated people's participation in elections, or it has influenced election processes and outcomes in the way that the architectures of the political of the act wanted it to. Uh, and so there's a need to look at the political parties integrity act. I think the architectures of that act were looking at similar legislation in Papua New Guinea and looking at how it could work in the case uh, of Solomon Islands. Um, Oh yeah, and, and the other side of it is that even if we do have strong political parties, the question arises, how well do voters understand the political parties and how they participate in it? For most voters in Solomon Islands, I would argue that their choice of who they elect is not necessarily because that person belongs to a political party or not. It's more because that person is related to them or there is a potential that that person, when he or she gets into parliament, will give them something in return. 
And so looking at democracy and looking at how it operates at a very local level in these countries and what are the factors that influence people's participation or refusal to participate in the governance process. Uh, and so looking at political parties on one hand, but on the other hand, looking at voters' understanding uh, of political parties. On fundamental rights, uh, uh, Solomon Islands did not do very well, particularly on social rights and equity. Uh, and I think the reason for that are similar to issues raised in places like Fiji uh, and Papua New Guinea. Um, access to justice in Solomon Islands is often complicated and expensive. Uh, and so a lot of people can't afford it. Not only because they can't afford lawyers, but because they can't afford to go to where these services are available. And many times they are available only in urban centers or in places far away from where most people live. Uh, and so those kinds of issues become important to look at. Uh, more recently, particularly in the past two years, with COVID-19 and state of emergency, which is still going on in the Solomon Islands. Although Solomon Islands does not have community infection of COVID-19, the government has been very strict. Uh, and therefore it raises questions about the responses to pandemic, just like responses to natural disasters, as Romulo mentioned, uh, responses to pandemic and issues of human rights. Uh, and in the case of Solomon Islands, the cases that they've had so far uh, have been restricted in the quarantine centers. And so questions arise, what kinds of rights do people have in quarantine centers uh, around Honiara? Uh, checks on government, uh, we've scored, Solomon Islands scored quite high in terms of media integrity. Uh, but then the question arises, Yes, there is media freedom in Solomon Islands, but what is the quality of the media that we have? Uh, and I think quality of media reporting is equally important uh, as we assess these things. Uh, judicial independence parliament, effective parliament, Solomon Islands parliament has performed quite well in most cases. Uh, the parliamentary committees have worked quite well uh, independence judiciary uh, has also performed uh, reasonably well. Impartial administration, that's a big issue. And like Papua New Guinea and to a certain extent Fiji as well, corruption is a huge challenge uh, in Solomon Islands. Uh, not only actual corruption or the cases that have been prosecuted, but also perceptions of corruption. So the mere perception of corruption has often affected the way in which governments function and also the way in which citizens interact with government. Uh, Solomon Islands in 2018 uh, enacted the Anti-Corruption Act. Uh, and as a result of that act, there was the establishment of the Independent Commission on Corruption. However, that act has not worked well as well as we wanted to. Uh, just this morning in the Solomon Star, say Albert Kabui, who was the former uh, governor general, came out in the media saying that there is a need to review the Anti-Corruption Act because it has not worked in the way that we wanted it to. Uh, and again, just like Papua New Guinea, one of the challenges uh, associated with corruption is the politicization of nearly every aspect of Solomon Islands institutions. Uh, and so that raises the question about public service and the need for reform uh, within public service. Because we've seen, particularly since the 1990s up until now, an increasing politicization uh, of the public service. In terms of participatory engagement, uh, Solomon Islands scored, um, in terms of participatory engagement. 
Okay, the, the, the train in... Uh, the, the, the trend in, in civil society participation in Solomon Islands over the years is quite interesting. And I, I suppose I was looking at the civil society participation trend. Uh, and you will notice that from the 1980s up until the 1990s, you see Solomon Islands, more civil society participation in Solomon Islands. And I think that is in part a reflection of the way in which civil society organizes itself within the country, uh, as well as government responses to it. Uh, there is more organization in the 1980s up until recently. Local democracy trend over time uh, is also interesting and Solomon Islands hasn't participated, uh, hasn't scored very well. Now, let me quickly comment on a number of things in terms of reform. Uh, I mentioned a whole lot of things uh, but I want to point out a couple of things. One is the need for electoral reform in the Solomon Islands, uh, and electoral reform that enables people to participate much better, but also ensures that those who eventually represent them in parliament uh, are elected by a majority of the voters. Uh, and along with that is voter education. And that's something I understand that it's difficult and longer term. But ultimately, who we elect into parliament depends not only on the institutions that we have, but also on the voters that we have. Uh, and then the second thing is public service reform. Uh, I think that's something that is very important. People have talked about it uh, in the Solomons for a long time, uh, but we haven't seen it uh, for, uh, since independence. Political Parties Integrity Act needs to be revealed. The Anti-Corruption Act, as the former Governor General recently uh, talked about. The other thing that I wanted us to think about is the intersection between economic development and democracy. Uh, and I think that's very important that people have access to economic development opportunities so that they can ensure they participate in democracy processes. And as I mentioned earlier on, uh, the increasing politicization of Solomon Islands institution, I think will over time corrode democracy uh, in Solomons. 2021 and moving forward, I think the biggest challenge now, like elsewhere in the world is COVID-19. Uh, Solomon Islands, as I mentioned earlier on, still doesn't have uh, uh, community infections, but if we do, it will be disastrous. Uh, it will have huge implications on governance. It will have huge implications on economic development. Uh, and people are really fearful. Uh, government is very cautious. Uh, and we're looking at things that are happening in Fiji and Papua New Guinea with great concern. Papua New Guinea in particular, because we share a border with them. Uh, and some of the infections that we've seen in the quarantine have come from Papua New Guinea through boats that are coming in from Leh. Uh, so far, the government has been able to control that, uh, but how long we'll be able to do that is another issue. Uh, and you know, the pandemic is a serious one like everywhere else. So I'll stop there and we'll open it up for discussions. Thank you so much, Professor. Yep. So um, yeah, there's so much to discuss, I think, with, um, with uh, our presentations, but I can see from uh, your commentary and from Serena's and Romulus that there are indeed um, uh, similarities between the three countries in terms of uh, the data that we have presented and the experiences of, of your countries as well. And so I think this is the best time now that we can open up the floor for questions uh, or comments from our audience. Um, but I think I would like to go first to ask, uh, uh, raise a question among our three um, 
uh, very good speakers and experts. I, I think Serena um, mentioned this uh, already and I just want to follow up uh, between the three that um, under, yes, of course, under fundamental rights uh, is not very specific in the data, but as, as, as we know, uh, a common issue among the earth countries is the underrepresentation of women and politics. And Serena mentioned this, that there's no, no there's no women uh, MP. Um, and I think with Solomon, you only have a couple of MPs, uh, very less than 10% representation. Fiji, probably a little bit higher, but uh, it's not as high as we want it to be as well. So my question is, what do you think uh, would be needed uh, to be done? What are the factors that needs to be addressed to uh, at least, you know, find a way to increase the representation of women in politics? Serena, would you like to go first? Sure, Laila. Um, so I, I mentioned it because, I mean, obviously in PNG, we do have this you know, big problem with um, women not being represented in parliament, particularly this parliament. Um, and I think that the problem is, uh, like, there, there's so many um, factors that are involved. Um, but I think already with the current push at wave for temporary special measures um, to have women um, go in through sort of reserve seats. There's very split thinking on it here. Um, and it's, uh, it's highly political, like it's, you know, people get emotionally charged when they're talking about it. I think for me, I'm very pragmatic, really. Um, Parliament is there to represent the people and to represent the interests of the people um, and to make sure that voices are heard. I'm in support of temporary special measures. Um, I think it is important uh, because we are seeing, especially on our social indicators, um, PNG is falling behind, especially around health and education. That is not the job of women, obviously, to raise uh, these issues on the floor of Parliament. But I think a diversity of different views will help to ensure that the debate is more robust. Um, but in order for us to also do that, you need to make sure that women councils are working, that um, the whole bottom-up process is also um, there. And I think that's going to be the challenge for us, even in trying to put in place such a reform. Um, but uh, really, it is, um, it is a challenge. And we're going to see in 2022 how women begin to mobilize and organize. Um, but I think that hopefully we're going to start seeing some shifts. I'm always very hopeful in Papua New Guinea because of the youth bulge that we are experiencing. Obviously, it is a it is a risk and a threat, but it's also an opportunity because I think a younger generation thinks a bit differently um, and has higher expectations um, of the type of society they want to live in. So it's a structural problem, um, but we're going to have to see uh, what happens in the lead up because I think this government's been quite supportive in temporary special measures, and that's for Papua New Guinea. Thank you. Thanks, Serena. Professor Tarsicius, do you want to add anything else? Yeah, in, in the case of Solomon Islands, I think there are currently three women in parliament, uh, which again does not represent the population of women in the country. Uh, and like in Papua New Guinea, there have been discussions of temporary uh, special measures uh, to allocate certain number of seats for women. And like in Papua New Guinea, it has invoked a lot of debate, a lot of emotions, a lot of discussions. Uh, I do not see uh, leadership coming from the current government in terms of putting that in place. And so I'm not sure that that will happen before the next election in 2023. Uh, and the women who have, you know, oh, I think there are four now, one uh, just won the election uh, or the by-election earlier this year. Uh, the women who are now in parliament uh, have managed to get into parliament either because of organization of women groups, and they have been quite strong prior to elections. Uh, and so supporting those groups, I think, uh, is important. Uh, and there have been assistance, I think, from UNDP and DFAD and other organizations to help organize women's uh, uh, groups, educate voters, and so forth. But the other two came into parliament uh, as a result of their husbands, either who were in parliament, one of them died. And so his wife was elected 
in his constituency. Uh, the other one, interestingly, uh, the husband was kicked out as a result of corruption. Uh, he was taken to court, uh, he was kicked out, he disqualified, and then his wife contested and won. Uh, so interesting dynamics in the Solomons. Thank you, Professor. Romulo, do you want uh, to add anything else? No, uh, thanks. Uh, you know, it's, it's important also to recognize uh, uh, that in the context of Fiji, it's really the political party system that not only encourages, but also, you know, strengthen, uh, facilitates uh, women's political representation. And what we've seen, at least in this parliament and the uh, previous parliament, which are the products of a new electoral system, uh, is that through the party um, membership as well as through the party structure, that's where they've been able to push uh, for women uh, representation. Uh, you know, Fiji statistics that in 1995, about 4.3% of women uh, uh, were in parliament, but in 2020, that has gone up to 21.6%. Uh, with our current uh, 51 seat parliament, we have more than 11 we have 11 women uh, members of parliament. Uh, in the government side, there's about uh, six uh, or five. In the opposition side, there's about six um, uh, or six, five. And uh, you know, most of the women in the government side are cabinet ministers or assistant cabinet ministers. So you'll see that how the party structures and places the women uh, representatives also determines uh, in a lot, uh, in many respects, their um, uh, their uh, electability as well as their role uh, when they are in parliament as members of parliament. Yeah. Okay, so, you know, the, the whole issue of TPC, I'm sorry, was debated, was discussed, but we find mm -hmm. that in working through the current structure or the political party system, that that's uh, been also an open door to push for women's political participation. Uh, and of course, recognizing the great amount of work that women's groups uh, and NGOs have also put in to raise more awareness uh, on the issue of women's political participation. Okay, thank you so much, Romulo. So um, perhaps you can take a look at our chat feature here. If uh, anybody of our participants, listeners would like to pose a question, uh, you can use the chat function or use the raise hand function. Uh, those also on Facebook, you know, feel free to also you uh, comment there as well. I think we have uh, okay. We have a question that came in from Facebook. So the question is: How big a concern is social media in relation to democracy? Is it worth looking at? So this question came from Sheldon. Sheldon, to which country would you like to address the question or to all three of them? Perhaps we can just assume that it will be to the three of them. So Romulo, would you like to start? Thanks, Maybe thanks. Uh, <laughs> oh, thanks, uh, uh, Naila and Sheldon. That's a very, very important question. For me, I see that social media is crucial, if not, uh, uh, fundamental to our whole system of democracy, uh, where especially in uh, uh, you know, democracies like ours that are in transition, uh, where there often is intimidation, where there often is suppression of uh, freedom of expression, uh, robust debates and discussions on topical issues that people often tend to rely on social media uh, to translate or to transmit. Uh, the necessary invitation, uh, information that they would like to put on the public platform as well as conversing. So, so in my perspective, uh, social media is important um, uh, and they provide a useful platform for engagement, for citizen participation and for dialogue. Uh, uh, on a whole range of issues. And I find that it is not only citizens that have used social media effectively to raise concerns, to highlight issues of governance, to uh, pinpoint uh, challenges of governance by the, by the by government, but also government themselves has used social media uh, in terms of uh, 
facilitating information as well as sharing information. And particularly in this time of pandemic, people are resorting to social media uh, to get the information, to uh, cre uh, ensure informed choices around vaccines, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, going forward, uh, there needs to be a lot more uh, robust spaces created for social media. And there must be a lot of restraint from trying to regulate or overregulate uh, social media uh, in this respect. But of course, there is a, a recognition uh, that uh, you know there needs to be certain um, policies in place that could guide uh, uh, you know uh, and prevent the issues like online bullying uh, and and other forms of vices that are also propagated on, so, on, on social media but uh, to answer Sheldon's question in a runabout kind of way uh, it is big it is important and it is uh, crucial for any democracy particularly here in the Pacific thanks okay how about you professor Tercius? do you have any take on this yeah, definitely. And uh, Vinaka Romolo for that. I, I agree with Romolo uh, that social media is huge uh, and you find it everywhere. I come from a part of the Solomon Islands where I never saw a car until I was 12 years old. Uh, kids from my village still don't see cars. Uh, it's that remote, but they are on social media. Uh, they jump the car age right into the internet age. Uh, and so the challenge is this. Yes, social media can be very useful. Uh, and Pacific Islanders have used it, whether Shop Talk in Papua New Guinea or any of the social media platforms uh, around the Pacific. But at the same time, while it provides us the opportunity to participate, it also provides the opportunity to be misused as well. Uh, and we've seen it particularly with COVID-19, not only in Pacific Island places, but here uh, in the US. And so my thing is this, I think that we should embrace it, but we should also in the longer term, prepare our people on how to use it. The technology is gonna come, it's here already. The technology is going to keep changing and Facebook will be stone age in the next couple of years something else will come up. Uh, and so the question then arises, are Pacific Island countries training their next generation on how to use these platforms responsibly? Uh, and what that means is that here we have all this social media technology, but we don't see them in our curriculums. Are we introducing how to use these things properly through our school system so that in 10 years time, we have a population that is not only technologically literate, but technologically responsible as well. So those are my thoughts. Thank you, Professor. How about you, Serena? Anything to add? Um, yeah, so definitely um, a, a very important question. And uh, I mean, for Papua New Guinea, we've seen great transformation with the liberalization of the telecommunications sector. 2007 um, was the year that we had uh, the second uh, mobile company, Digicel, actually my current employer, um, come into the country. And it's really shifted things in terms of um, creating spaces for dialogue. And without spaces for uh, participation and, and dialogue, dialogue in environments where government acts like in a very closed way and it's not easily accessed, it's been fundamental. Um, and we've seen shifts now in political culture, um, people that are you know, anti-corruption activists that have used social media as a platform to then contest elections have now gotten in. And I think it's, it's not only about political participation, but it's also about the digital economy. And that's been one of the greatest advantages of um, social media, particularly Facebook, allowing local entrepreneurs to rise, trade with each other. And that's really what we need to see shift for Papua New Guinea, countries like mine, where the extractives um, industry dominates the economy, we have to start building a more inclusive economy and telecommunications um, allows for that. It will also allow for the quality um, that we need to see as well in terms of our democracy and people participation. Um, so I, I also had another question that had come through um, from my um, chat and I just wanted to just raise it here. 
um, by one of the Papua New Guinean audience that asked uh, me to comment on the last five years and the um, uh, what, what we've seen in terms of the trends. Um, I think for me, really what I'm interested in is seeing the engagement of people and local actors, how we are becoming more democratic in, in terms of our culture. And I'll keep talking about young people till the cows come home, but they're so important in terms of being able to build up a more inclusive culture that actually values the, the values of of democracy. And this also comes back fundamentally to the individual and where do we place the individual, how they're able to think for themselves and act in their own accord. In 2016, um, <clears throat> we had very big riots across our universities, protests, and uh, the, you know, against the, the government of the day. And we saw the mobilization of young people actually have an impact on the 2017 elections. Um, PNC <clears throat> that was in power lost a number of its critical seats. And that really is the power of the youth and mobilization, what they're able to do and they come solidly behind the cause. For us though, the problem is how do you sustain that type of action? How do you sustain those important um, spaces for critical discussions around reform? So we begin shifting the culture and the politics away from the individual big man towards actually, what are the policies that are gonna help take this country forward? What's the policies that are gonna help take our region forward? Because a stronger Pacific means a stronger Australia. Um, and uh, I think in a time where we're seeing also um, China begin to play a more active role in our region in terms of trade and using aid um, across, you're also seeing now that clash of, um, you know, communist controlled government, authoritarian government versus democratic ideals. And young people are watching this debate happen on Facebook, but really how are we going to control that narrative and explain to young people the type of principles, the type of culture, the type of economy that's needed to help improve their quality of life. At the end of the day, it's about the quality of life of the individuals. Um, and, and that's a, like a whole shift that has to happen. But I think with the Pacific, I'll go back again, the strength lies with the youth and, and we really have to harness that. Okay. Thank you so much, Serena. Uh, we have a question here from Avinash, oh, a former colleague. Welcome back, Avinash. Uh, please go ahead. Thank you, Nala. Uh, you can hear me? Yes, we can perfectly yeah. hear you. Sorry, I can't show my face because my hair is very long. <laughs> it's okay. Uh, it's, uh, thanks for the opportunity. Uh, I'm, I know, I think, two of the panelists, uh, Professor uh, Tassisis and uh, Romulo. But my question is to um, Professor Tassistas. You know, I just um, um, felt that I was in his classroom ages ago when, because he, what he mentioned, like what he outlined, almost uh, sounds the same. Like, you know, there's rampant corruption, you know, problem with the um, voting system problem. There's uh, all sort of thing. You know, it seems that hardly much has changed. My, I, I'm wondering what, what good has happened over the years in terms of democracy and uh, especially in relation, to, in relation to democracy. He mentioned that uh, CSOs have, uh, uh, they play a good role or the important role. So it seems that CSOs have been playing such a good uh, important role that people have all of a sudden uh, have become too much dependent on them or they see them as uh, the uh, alternative to the state. And he also mentioned the last thing, you know, he said that there should be more relationship between economic empowerment and democracy. But, you know, given that uh, limited resources uh, or industries that Solomon Islands have, what do you think would be the economic opportunities that uh, the government uh, could create? Because the government, I think, may want to, but there are limited opportunities for them to create that. Thanks, Nella. Professor? Naka Avinas Bula, it's good to uh, hear from you again. And thank you for those really wonderful questions. Uh, I think what we've seen, and, and, and you're absolutely right, that if you look back 10 years ago, or even 20 years ago, nothing much has changed. Uh, not only in the case of Solomon Islands, but we see it uh, in many parts of the Pacific, except for places like Palau or some of the smaller island countries. Uh, and part of the reason for that, and particularly for the case of the Solomons, is the political instability uh, that we've had. Uh, high turnover of government, uh, a violent crisis uh, from the late 1990s to 2003. We had 14 years of regional 
assistance mission from Papua New Guinea, uh, from Australia and the rest of our Pacific Island neighbors. And during that time, uh, it was mostly Solomon Islands was on recovery mode uh, in the 14 years of Ramsey. And so that's part of the reason for that. In terms of economic development, uh, I personally believe that Solomon Islands doesn't have a problem with resources. It has a problem with management. Uh, that Solomon Islands has a lot of resources that could be utilized for purposes of economic development. Uh, but we have had problems managing how we use that and also managing the money or the income generated from that, that kind of resources, whether it's fisheries, forestry, now increasingly mining at the moment. So those are not all natural resource-based uh, uh, resources. There is also oil palm plantation. Uh, and increasingly, a lot of people are now getting into agriculture, but less support from government. Uh, and so it's how we manage the economic development that's important. And the reason why I mentioned the intersection between economic development and democracy, one of the reasons is that many Solomon Islanders at the moment are too busy trying to survive economically. They don't have time to think about whether they are participating uh, in the governance process and how they are doing it. Their daily engagement is figuring out what are we going to eat at the end of today. Uh, and so if we can improve people's livelihoods, then they can begin thinking about governance process and how they participate in that. I hope that answers your question, Avanes, and it's really wonderful to see you, I must say. Thanks. Thank you so much, Professor. Okay, we have a question here from uh, Shailendra. Shailendra, go ahead. Okay, thank you very much. Just a very few quick observations. Firstly, thank you, Idea, and thank you, speakers, for a very important uh, session. And I found it really informative. I'm from a media journalism background, and these two are very closely linked, media and democracy. So I'm gonna talk very quickly a bit about democracy, just some observations. I agree about the need for education on social media. There's a huge gap in the curriculum, not just at university level, University level is catching up to some extent, but what we need is a curriculum at the grassroots level at primary school, secondary school, because the learning has to start early and it has to be ongoing. And I think we were not, under, we were not understating when we said that social media has a huge impact on democracy and the impact is sometimes diabolical. I'll give you a very quick example about how mainstream media is affected by social media in our very region. First of all, mainstream media, they use social media, yes. It's a very important tool for mainstream media, but because of the abuse of social media, what's happening is that governments in the region are passing draconian legislation in order to control social media. However, mainstream media are getting caught in the crossfire. The legislation also affects mainstream media even though professional journalists are not abusing social media. So mainstream media also becoming restricted, which is a backward step, step as far as democracy is concerned. And then again, I really agree about the comment about media freedom. Sorry, the freedoms afforded to media is a measure of democracy, yes, but also the media output, the quality of the product, the news product. The problem in our region is this, Mainstream media organizations, they are not competitive salary wise. So there's a huge attrition of professional journalists. It's not an easy solution. It's very easy to point out the problem. Finding the solution is much harder. So we've got a huge brain drain from journalism into other communication sectors. For example, government departments can pay much better salaries than the news media organizations. The other problem is that um, journalists are not very well educated. Many of them, maybe less than 50%, at least in Fiji, 
and some other Melanesian countries, less than 50% are university educated. So what we really have in journalism is an underqualified, undertrained, and an inexperienced young journalist cohort forced to address some really, really complex issues. And uh, this is something that needs to be addressed by more training in specific areas. Thank you. Thank you, Shalendra. We have um, a question here from, okay, just probably we, just to probably take note that uh, we have gone beyond our allotted time, but since you know, this discussion has been really quite dynamic and productive. So I hope the speakers and our listeners are still on board. If probably we can uh, do another five minutes of discussion. Yep. I think there's a really good question here from uh, Jayath on the, his comment is that Pacific nations are rich with their own traditional and religious structures of governance. However, in some cases, they have been pushed away with the accusation that they are politicized. How important it is to include, demarcate, or totally remove such models from democratic governance. So who among our speakers would like to uh, take that on first? Professor Tarsicius, do you want to? I think Romolo is the most qualified because of his <laughs> experiences. <laughs> okay, Romolo. Is yours. Thanks. Thank you, uh, Professor, for that uh, hospital pass. Uh, it, it, it certainly is an, a very interesting question, and it comes uh, from uh, uh, you know, the need, particularly uh, when we're looking at the political dynamics in Fiji, uh, uh, to be addressed, because as, as uh, uh, the commentator has uh, rightfully alluded to, and, uh, and of course I recognize that uh, Mr. Jaga is a um, uh, political party leader uh, here in Fiji and recognizes that tensions and the struggles where the church and, the, and uh, religious institutions are accused of being politicized. I probably start on the notion that politics is everything, you know, and everything around us is uh, uh, can be defined, can be argued in the context of politics. And it is important to be engaging in politics, whether it is the church, whether it is the uh, traditional structures, uh, because politics ultimately is about the representative will of the people and the people uh, in the Pacific, for example, are religious in the Pacific, are cultural. Uh, and it is very important to recognize that you bring religion and you bring culture into your politics. Uh, and, and therefore, uh, these identities must be able to uh, complement and strengthen our politics as opposed to be um, ostracized and marginalized and, and said that you know, they have no part to play. Uh, because whether we uh, appreciate that or not, uh, when, when we go to, for example, a traditional Fijian village, uh, we, uh, and, and in a time of politics, you'd look at the, the, the village rep members as a constituency, but the village members are also part of a traditional and a religious structure, uh, and they cannot be disassociated from each other in that respect. I find that uh, therefore it is important in the context of uh, Fiji, uh, in the context of the Pacific, that religion and culture, uh, for the religious and cultural forms of governance needs to be encouraged and needs to find its synergy with uh, Western political democracy or democracy, democratic process in itself. They for me complement and strengthen uh, our political systems as opposed to weaken and diminish the value of the Western democratic systems that we have inherited. Uh, you know, uh, our history books tells us that even before Western democratic uh, systems were in place, we have functioning uh, systems uh, that were both traditional, that were both religious. Uh, and therefore, uh, in that light, I find that um, uh, they have a bigger part to play uh, in strengthening our democratic and governance systems in the Pacific and in the context of Fiji, of course, uh, in, in that respect. Thanks. Thank you so much, Romulo. I think we have 
to unfortunately end our session here. Thank you so much to everyone. Uh, it was such a really dynamic and also a learning experience um, for, for me and I, I'm pretty sure to our, some of our participants as well, uh, this fruitful exchange. And I, I think uh, 90 minutes, two hours is not enough to really unpack all these issues. But given the depth and scope of this exchange, I certainly look forward to you know, further discussions on how the democracies in the Melanesia can be strengthened and maintained. There are certainly um, issues that really needs to be immediately addressed um, to avoid further backsliding. But I think the ideas and the um, reforms that were brought forward here today uh, are certainly food for thought. So uh, probably we'll see um, in the ne near future, uh, we'll probably continue and focus on, on some of these reforms. Uh, also, on behalf of IDEA, I wish to once again express our sincere thanks to our guest speakers, to Serena Romulo, um, Associate Professor Tarsitius, to our Regional Director Lena for generously sharing their time and expertise. And before we formally close this webinar, I would like to ask everyone to probably switch on their video for uh, a group screenshot so it's not photo op anymore or photo shoot so a <laughs> group screenshot i'll let uh, rajan take over from here thank you so much to everyone to all our online participants and those listening and viewing from facebook as well thank you so we have few blank screens avinash is setting his hair <laughs> all right <laughs> Down. Another one. Uh, sorry. One, two. All right. Thank you very much. All are looking nice. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Renaka, <clears> thank you, Thomas. Renaka, thank you, Professor. Thank you. Thank you, Mother. Thank you, Mother. Thank you, Professor. Thank you, 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 Thank you,